morning, Waterbrook. It's, it's a privilege and a humble honor to be with you this morning just to pray a prayer that the Lord gave me uh, with you today. So be comforted. Uh, the song that I heard on the way over to church today was that there was power in the name of Jesus. So we lift that prayer up to him now with the hope and the knowledge that he hears our prayer. So bow your heads with me now as we pray to our God. Holy, gracious, and merciful Father, we come into your presence today with thankful hearts that you are our God. Your glory and your majesty surrounds us, and the heavens proclaim your immeasurable power. Today we honor and we bow in reverence before you and acknowledge your divine nature and your eternal holiness. We acknowledge our pride, our arrogance, our piety, our sin, and our desperate need of your grace and mercy this morning. We have been led astray by our forgetful, fearful, and stubborn hearts, and we ask for your free gift of forgiveness today. As the spring rains today bring new life, we ask that you would wash us with the holy blood of your Savior Christ, your Son, who so freely gave himself unto death so that our hearts would be made new. Bring transformation to our minds and our souls so that your true peace and joy may return to us and that we can walk with you in your immeasurable love and eternal friendship. Father, there are so many in our body who are dealing with fear and the emotional stress and trauma from all that the coronavirus has set into motion around the world. Death, loss, and suffering has brought so many to their knees, Lord, with nowhere else to turn. We pray for your compassion and your merciful healing and that our prayers would touch your heart and your truth and comfort would be upon all who would ask. We ask that this world would be, that, that this would be a time when priorities of men and worldly pursuits would be shaken and realigned with your divine purpose and that the gift of grace and your eternal salvation would be the hope for all. Build your kingdom by showing that this is only by your hand, that it is by only your hand that man has real and true life. Now, as Pastor Kevin comes to preach the message that you have given him through your spirit, we pray that it would penetrate our hearts and that we would hear your precious truths so that we may gain an understanding and a knowledge of you and be your holy servants forever. We ask this in your precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and King. Amen. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And each one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. I 
Thank you, uh, Bruce, for praying, and thank you, uh, Laurel, for reading. Some of you may not know, but when I come in on Sunday mornings, now that we're doing the live streaming, they have spotlights right above me. So Laurel doesn't just read scripture, she, she buffs my head so it doesn't shine so much. Uh, so thank you, Laurel, for all that you do <laughs> on a Sunday morning. I want to invite you out of Isaiah. I want you to think, I'm, I'm just going to put you on the trajectory right away of what's happening in Isaiah. Do you see how God, in his calling of Isaiah, must bring him to an encounter with the holiness of God? That's what he does. And uh, I want you to think for a moment contextually at what a, term, uh, what a time of turmoil that was. The people of Israel had been taken off into captivity, or we were being taken off into captivity. It was a time of great darkness and difficulty, and Isaiah's calling was to be a prophet of God during a painful time in the history of God's people. And yet we see all the way through the book of Isaiah this great gospel hope coming through that God, though he will cause us to be grieved, as we saw in our Lamentations verse this morning, that he doesn't grieve without bringing compassion and love. And I hope that as we're going through this time of incredible global and national unsettledness, personal unsettledness for all of us, that there would be a building expectation in the lives of God's people that God is up to something, that God is at work, that God is purposing to do a good work. And so you and I, when we come to think through and process everything that's going on around us, what you and I are being called to think and what we're being called to do is just simply align ourselves with our God or to invite God to realign us with himself. And so as we come to study the, the Lord's Prayer, and as we uh, look at um, this uh, familiar text of Scripture, one of the things I want you to realize in this text of Scripture is it's at a time of, you know, enormous transition again. This is a time of fulfillment. That's what Matthew's gospel is all about. Everything the prophets, like Isaiah, were expecting are now about to be realized. But having said that, it would be when Christ come, a day of unsettled shakenness. Remember the cross and resurrection, how it shook the disciples, how their expectations were turned upside down, and the launching of the disciples. Because remember what, how Matthew ends? The Gospel of Matthew ends with Christ calling his disciples, therefore go into all the world and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And then what's the promise? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Isn't that great news? That, that promise stands true. The calling stands uh, st uh, still stands for the people of God, but the promise of God. And so you and I need to understand that when God calls his people to himself, the thing that he does is he tunes his people to himself. Understand that? There is a tune-up, a refining work that begins with the people of God, as not because he's abandoning them, but because he's going to work powerfully through them. And so um, I want you to look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 this morning. This is the beginning of what we have commonly called the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I want you to think for a moment, just pray, because Jesus says we're going to make our way through this for the next little while. I'm hoping you get some fresh invigoration and focus by the, the Lord's Prayer and that it will lose its, you know how uh, familiarity breeds contempt? I, I, I hope it loses that kind of familiarity and it becomes all the more precious. Do you know how precious Romans 8 has been to us? Would it be true that the Lord's Prayer would have that same sort of hopeful expectation for all of us? So here's, if you were to ask Jesus, what are the priorities that should shape the prayer life of the disciples of the kingdom? Ask him, where would you start? This is where he starts. And again, I'm going to reiterate this. He is not teaching you a prayer to say on Sundays and on special occasions. He is teaching us the priorities of the kingdom of God. 
and that as we're going through the COVID crisis, as we're going through whatever crises and challenges are in our lives, what should we be praying? What are the priorities? What passion should grip our lives? And as he lays this out, this is where it begins. And so that's where we start today. We need to pray that God would be hallowed. Right? So look at verse 9. Let's read it and let's pray it in our hearts. Pray, he says, in verse 9 of Matthew 6, then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the passion of Jesus. Now, I'm going to... I'm going to invite you this week, if you have time, if you're, if you're uh, reading the Bible and you've got a little gap there or you want to take some time to do this, read through Jesus' relationship with his Father in the Gospel of John. Just read through the Gospel of John and watch how Jesus was shaped by wanting to honor the name of his Father. It gripped him. It shaped everything that he did. And when we come to the Sermon on the Mount, in particular Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, Jesus is laying out the priorities of his kingdom. Here is the Messiah coming. Here is the King, the Prince of Peace, who is coming to establish the kingdom of God. And as he begins to teach what discipleship looks like, what kingdom citizenship looks like, right, as he lays that out, what he tells us is, this is not slack time, this is serious time. This is not us compromising and just kind of having an easy road. He is about to engage the world with his kingdom. And and, and so he begins to announce the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he announces the kingdom of God has come. And if you're a citizen of the kingdom, these are the characteristics. And he begins to say that what happens in the kingdom of God is that he is not forming another religious group. He's not trying to start a religious movement where we have all these external parameters and practices that go on that mark us out. He is coming to radically transform the hearts of men and make them true worshipers of God. That's what John says. God seeks true worshipers, those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And so as we come into this text of Scripture on the Sermon on the Mount, we need to understand that what's being taught here, what Christ is seeking to do here, is to deepen our awe and amazement and wonder of God. That's where it begins. That's where it begins. And so, um, you know, I, I have a few quotes that I put uh, on, on the slide there. You should see this one from Martin Luther. If you, if you wonder what the biggest need right now in America is, what the biggest need in the world is right now, People need an accurate view of God, right? I, I, I got to tell you right now, um, right now the issue facing America is not that we have a constitutional crisis. We have a spiritual crisis. We don't have a political crisis. We have a spiritual crisis. We don't have a financial economic crisis going on right now. We have a spiritual need. People have turned from the Lord. They're not seeking His face. They're adapting their religious life to their worldly life. And Christ has come to say, and so you know what, when we get struggling, Martin Luther, can you imagine Martin Luther and Erasmus, what they were facing? And he writes to Erasmus and he says, you got too little of a God. Your God is all too human. And, you know, it echoed some of the passages of Scripture. You thought I was altogether like you. And that's not the way God is. God is not like us. He's not sweating in the heavens. He's not aiming at the, 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 the minimalistic concerns. My dear, God, my dear friends, God is on the throne right now. And what we need to pray above all is that people get a vision of God as he really is. A holy and a reigning God. And so listen to this. We're, I'm going to take you into Isaiah today. I'll show you why in a second. But in Isaiah chapter 64, if you got the note sent out by Lisa earlier this week, I had a typo at Isaiah 60. It's Isaiah 64. Here's what Isaiah prays. Isaiah that Laurel just read from, right? Who was, who was in, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, who encounters the holiness 
of God in the year of King Uzziah's death. Here was a godly king who dies. Here is a nation coming into a day of darkness. And as he comes into the presence of God, as Isaiah comes, the Lord brings him to himself, and he's, he, is high and lift, he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and his train is filling the temple. And what are the angels singing? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This is the starting point for Isaiah's calling and ministry. And so Isaiah, as he gets to the end of the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 64, it says, Oh, that the Lord would rend the heavens and come down. This is, this is what I want to show you. This is what it looks like to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Oh, Lord, you, that the Lord would rend the heavens and come down, and that the mountains might quake at your presence as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes the water to boil. What's he saying here? God set the world on fire. When, that, when we get the branches burning and it gets so hot immediately that it flashes and comes up and the water begins to boil, bring us out of our lethargy. And bring us out of our lethargy by giving us a look at your holiness. Right? To make your name known to your adversaries that the, na the nations may tremble in your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. See what he's praying? That's what it means to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Pray that God would come down and let people see his glory. Our young people who are bored out of their skull, they're only bored because they don't know God. The generation that is trying to find the, their, their IRAs and their pensions all in place so they, they can kind of glide to the end of their lives in a reasonable amount of comfort. Let's pray that they see something better than a casual life. Let them see the glory and the holiness of God. Let them see God. Put fire back in the hearts of your people. Psalm chapter 2 verse 11 is a psalm that resonates with God in the coming, you know, in the time, you see in the time of Christ in Matthew, what they're anticipating, the Jews and the Gentiles, the nations raging at the plans of God, and God sitting in the heavens and laughing. And then these sobering words, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. We have a hard, we have a hard time putting together trembling and rejoicing, right? We just think to tremble means terror and negativity and you know, uh, Jonathan Edwards, sinners in the hands of an our angry God. We kind of think this dark cloud. But do you understand that the reason we can't rejoice in a world of chaos is because our God is too small? That we do not regard him as he actually is? And what he says is, I have seated my son on the throne. The, the forces of evil that have, have sought to bring him down have been defeated. My son is already seated there. The battle is, let the nations rage. Let the nations rage. Turn the news on every night. Let them rage. And then turn it off and let them reign. Because Christ reigns. We need a God that we can tremble before. Because when you can tremble before him, you can trust him. John Calvin wrote, the only true and salutary joy is that which arises from resting in the fear and reverence of God. Do you have a God that's big enough to tremble before? Do you have a God that you can rest in because nothing is too great for him? This is the God of Romans 8. If this God is for us, who can be against us? That's why we pray our Father. My dear friends, have you ever prayed the Lord's Prayer that way? Derek Thomas says, are you weary, losing faith in God's promises, tired in the heat of battle, overwhelmed by the opposition? Then what you need is a fresh glimpse of the majesty of God. Sometimes we can't see what is right before us and above us. So let me, let me just stop and say this. We pray that the Lord would be hallowed, our Father who art in heaven would be hallowed, because he will not be hallowed unless he helps us. Got it? You understand what I'm saying here? 
Why would you pray this? Because it's not a man, a man's ability to do this. We bow because unless God pulls back the curtain, unless God opens up our eyes, unless God gives, inclines our hearts, we will not see. We, isn't it true? How many of you come out in spring and think, wow, look how green the trees are. Right now, the apple orchards are blossoming. The crab apple trees are bright purple. The, the apple orchards over in Parley Lake I was driving are beginning to have white blossoms. When you see it for the first time, your eyes go, wow. Then you go to work every day and you drive by it. And what do you do? You become accustomed to the glory. What's the matter with our hearts? That we lose our gratitude. That we lose our reverence. So here's what I want you to see this morning. For those of us in the COVID crisis, if we spend more time pleading with the governor than pleading at the throne of grace, we aren't part of the solution, we're part of the problem. We need to plead that we would see the glory of God, high and lifted up with his train. Give us Isaiah's vision of God so we would not be timid and trembling but triumphant in the gospel. The great need of the church is a renewed vision of the absolute holiness of our God. We think that we need a God, we think that we need a God that we feel safe with. What we need is not a God we feel safe with. We need a God we can trust. We, need, we don't need a domesticated God to do our bidding. We need a holy God who's worthy of our worship, our trust in our absolute allegiance. So this is what we're beginning with in the Lord's Prayer. What Jesus is saying is pray for a rediscovery of, of reverence for God. Hallowed be your name. So here's, here's what I want to do with you this morning. I want to look at this text and I want to anchor it properly biblically. So here's Here's what I want you to see initially, and this, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the book of Isaiah, and I'll tell you why I'm going to go to the book of Isaiah to look this up. I mean, we already have with Laura reading Isaiah chapter 6 and so on, but the reason I want to do this is because in Matthew's gospel, Isaiah forms a significant part of the argument of Isaiah. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew is showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And so in Matthew chapter 1, we're told that the virgin will be with child, coming out of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, with the coming of John the Baptist, there'll be a voice crying in the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 15, a light in the darkness from Isaiah chapter 9, the people have seen a great light. But in Isaiah, we have this other reality that comes clear uh, to us, that the people, what? They hear, but they don't hear. They see, but they don't see. Now, here's what I, I want you to see. I'm going to show you this a little bit in this text this morning. But, but one of the things I want you to see in this passage of Scripture is that sometimes when we come to the Sermon on the Mount and we pray, Our Father who art in heaven, we are inclined to move towards this text and think in our heads that this is talking about our Father through Jesus Christ, the intimate nature of our relationship with God. And, and there are texts like this. I just don't think that's what Jesus is saying, and I don't think that's what Matthew's doing here, focusing on the intimacy. Because he doesn't use the word Abba here, he doesn't use the Aramaic language. He uses the word pater. And it is anchored in Isaiah's theology that the word isn't on a, a, a word primarily um, indicating intimacy. It's indicating honor. And um, so let me just take you, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Isaiah and... Um, and uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 64. That's primarily, I'm going to bring you to the kind of climactic end of the book of Isaiah. But um, if, if I want to reiterate from what Laurel read earlier, here's, here's, here's how Isaiah 6 reads. Isaiah begins that Isaiah in the year of King Uzziah's death sees the Lord high and lifted up, his train filling the temple, and the angels crying, holy, holy, holy. And what does he say? Woe is me. Why? I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a...
people of unclean lips. And one of the seraph flies and gets a fiery hot coal from the altar and brings it and puts it on his lips and says, your sins have forgiven. That's the starting point for his calling, an encounter with the holiness of God that makes him realize the depth not only of his sin, but the sin of the people. And then he says to them, the, the Lord says to him, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And you think, man, sometimes, have you ever volunteered for something and then afterwards thought, what kind of job did I get myself into? You ever done that? Because God says to them, okay, I'm going to go, pre I want you to go preach, but be speaking and they're not going to hear. You're going to be proclaiming and their hearts are going to be hardened. And that's the context of Isaiah's ministry. Isaiah's ministry is a group of people who have the glory of the Lord before them and they're deaf the promises of God, and they're distant. And the book of Isaiah, in a sense, is God allowing his people who have stopped hallowing his name to go off and learn what it means that he's a holy God, to discover what it is to neglect the holiness of God and be brought back into God's presence by his grace, encountering that he is not a God to be trifled with, and he is not a God of religious activity. He is a real God. That's why the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus in Matthew 5 to 7 is saying, let's not play at praying. Let's not pray religiously at almsgiving. Let's not pray at fasting. This is not a God of doing religion. This is a God who's real, and we need to get real with God. So in Isaiah chapter 64, he describes the, um, the reality that I read earlier, oh God, that you would come down from heaven and set the place on fire. And then down in verse 4, he says, from of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. He's saying, there's no God like our God. In history, in time, in reality, there's no God like our God. But then notice what he says in verse 6. We have all become like one who's unclean. All our righteous deeds are filthy rags. We, are, we fade like a leaf. Our iniquities like the wind take us away. There's no one who calls upon your name, who rouses to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. You see what happens if the Lord hands us over? Why do we have to pray, hallowed be your name? Because if God doesn't wake us up, we'll go hard and cold and distant and indifferent to the God is right before us and worthy of praise. Verse 7, sorry, verse 8. But now, O Lord, you are what? Our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. Most of you know we are the, you are the clay, we are the clay, you are the potter. But the context is our Father. We are the work of your hands. Do not be terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not our iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are your people. That's the Father language that we need to understand in Matthew. This is a Father, our lives depend. He is our Father because He forms us. We are the He's the potter, we're the clay. Unless he molds us and makes us, we have no hope. We are the work of his hands, right? We need to plead with God to make us who God has called us to be. To wake us and to call us to be his people. Otherwise, we don't even call out to him. So here's, here's what I want you to see initially. When we pray for the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be uh, your name. The first thing we need to say, see in Matthew chapter 6 verse 9, is that this is a collective prayer. Our Father. And so I say that for this reason, that we as the people of God need to begin by praying for the people of God. Before we pray for the politicians, let's pray for the people of God. Before we play, pray for the economy, let's pray for the people of God. We don't want to come out of covid not revering God. We don't want to come out of COVID still in our comfortable lifestyle. We don't want to come in dull and, 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 and indifferent to the glory of God. So 
what, what we need to see here is there is a, the, the Lord's Prayer begins with the collective prayer, our Father, our Father. It's rooted in Isaiah. It's rooting in, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. God, God, help us to hallow your name. What does that look like? What do we need to be saved from? I'm going to give you several things out of the out of the book of Isaiah, just that little section in Isaiah. But you know, one of the things I'm going to give the first one I'm going to give you is what Jesus picks up on in um, Matthew chapter 13 and Matthew chapter 15, verse 7, I, and it's this that we need to be saved from our religious, you know, um, practices that give us our comfort rather than a right relation. We we can fall into religious performance right that's that was the danger they hadn't stopped being religious but listen to what isaiah chapter 29 and verse 7 says and and jesus actually quotes this in matthew's gospel when he's confronting the pharisees in isaiah 29 verse 13 and the lord said because this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips but their hearts are what Far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by God. Therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, wonder upon wonder. Sometimes you don't want God to do wonderful things with the people of God. Do you understand? Because what's going on is that the people honor God with their lips, but in reality, where are their hearts? Their hearts are far from them. I had originally put in our notes that we need God to save us from our nominalism. And nominalism is simply this, that you and I can get in the habit of doing our spirituality mindlessly and taking comfort with the fact that we go to church on Sunday or that we teach or go to a youth group, that we sing, we're a part of the worship band, all of the things that we can do. We honor with our lips, but our hearts are unmoved by God and his gospel of his son. And that's what we got to begin to pray God, do not let me be a religious performer. Save me. That's what it means, hallowed be your name. Move it beyond the level of religious performance and nominalism. I don't want to play church anymore. And we, we need to come back and pray that prayer over each of our lives because we can, you can go through that. You ever done that where you're driving down the road on a long trip and then you sort of come to and realize, I didn't even notice the last 20 miles or the last 50 miles. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I've done that. Uh, where I, so you might have to avoid me on the highway. <laughs> but I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden I wake up and think, wow, I, I did, here we are already. I didn't even realize that we had passed. What did I miss? You know? And, and that's, that's what happens. You can get a comfortable religious life where you're not Seeking the face of God. You're not seeing the face of God. You're not savoring His holiness. That's what happened to Israel. And they were quite confident. They would do all the right things. That's what Jesus had to confront them with. They had their traditions of man. They were, when He went out with His disciples and people started eating what they thought they shouldn't eat and eating without washing their hands, they began to confront Jesus. Are you healing a man on the Sabbath? What are you doing? Why are your disciples not doing this? They were right down to the traditions of men and they were as far from God as could be. They couldn't see the most clear revelation of God standing before them, which was the very Son of God in human flesh. So that's the first thing that you and I need to begin to pray for. We have to pray that we could see and savor that God is holy. I'm going to throw a Mike Myers doing the PowerPoint. Can you run back to RC? I'll make you, I'll make you work for your zero money back there. There it is. See, uh, R.C. Sproul, and this is his book for young people in choosing my religion. If you don't delight in the fact that your father is holy, 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 then you're spiritually dead. You may be in a church, you may go to a Christian school, but if there's no delight in your soul for the holiness of God, you don't know God. You don't love God. You're out of touch with God. You're asleep to his character. Isn't it true that you can be deeply religious? The world is deeply religious. You can be deeply religious and terribly irreverent towards God because you don't treasure in pride. So we have to watch 
I have to watch when I'm preaching that I'm not going through the motions. I have to plead the Word of God over my own heart for eyes to see and ears to hear. Any of you who teach realize that. It's a blessing to be in the Word of God, but, but there is more. It, not many of you should be teachers for you will get a stricter account. Didn't that, shouldn't that cause you to tremble? Shouldn't it cause you to tremble? So we need to be saved from our religious performance. We also need to be saved from our religious pride. So let's go back to that Isaiah text. We started in Isaiah 64. We said God sent fire down from heaven and wake us up. Listen in Isaiah chapter 65 at the beginning. This is the Lord speaking to his people. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. (laughs) Isn't that something about God? Is God more inclined towards us than we are to him? Of course. He says, I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was call, not called by my name. It spread out, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that's not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens, making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the nights in secret places, who eat pig flesh and broth of tainted meat in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, I am too holy for you. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all the day. What's going on in this text of Scripture? God is calling them to repentance, and they're living the way they want to live, and they're not seeking God as his covenant people. Isn't that a warning to the people of God? And so here's the second thing we need to be saved. In my initial notes, I put from our religious narcissism, which is verse uh, verse 5, keep to yourself, do not come near to me, I'm too holy for you. Wow, no one can talk to them. We need to be saved from our religious pride. Here's one of the ways that you know you show reverence for God is that anybody can come to you at any time and talk to you about the, the, the glory and the will of God and you're inclined to hear them. It shouldn't be that God sends you, you know, 20 voices. Pro- Israel, he kept sending them prophets. Here I am, seek me. Here I am, return. And they said, no. And they, 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 and they would say to their prophets, get out of here. We're okay. We're holy in God's sight. And, and that should cause us to tremble because it's possible for some of us that we have been tuned out from the voices of God in our lives because we've been so content with our past experiences with God. That should cause you to tremble. We are not to live in relationship with God as if some event in the past was all that was needed. We need to revere the living God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and, and there is a way that we can actually dismiss people from being able to speak. You know, this could happen in your home. Your kids could come and say to you, Dad and Mom, this doesn't seem right. And you could say, who are you to talk to me? You've been bad-mouthing me all last week. You know what we're doing in that moment? In that moment, we're not leaning into God. In that moment, we're not listening to God. God, isn't it out of the mouths of babe? <laughs> you know, isn't it? it? There is a reality that in reverence for God, the day-to-day life is that God and his holiness would come and reveal to me my unholiness. That he would reveal to me my glory in it. And my answer isn't to anyone. I, it, you know, I would like to say, if the devil showed up and said, Dibley, straighten up. You're far from God. I'd listen to the devil if he was speaking the truth. Don't run off on that and build your theology or call me a heretic on this. The reality is that God, you know, Jesus tells the parable that he sends servant after servant to his people and they won't listen, and finally he sends their son, and they said, here comes the heir, what will we do? We'll kill him, rather than listen to. Let me ask you about your heart today. Is your heart leaning in and listening? That's what we mean when we say, hallowed be your name. Not theoretically, that, you, that, that every day I'm leaning in to hear and to see the glory and the holiness of God. 
that he might change and transform me. There's a scene in John's gospel, in John chapter 9, where Jesus heals a man who is, who is born blind from birth. And you remember that scene? And there's a conversation that goes on with the disciples because Jesus heals the man on what day? Sabbath day. What are the religious leaders doing? Can you, can you imagine how blind we are? They see a man they know has been blind from birth. And they say to him, Who, what happened here? Because we know Jesus is a sinner. And what does the man say? Well, I, all I can tell you is this, is I was blind and now I see. You know what they say to him in Matthew chapter 9, verse 28? It says, these are the religious leaders. They hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. Now, it's disciples of Moses. They should have been looking for the Messiah. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. And the man <laughs> answered and said, now, this is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does as well. Who's preaching the truth there? Who's the preaching the truth there? It's the blind man who's preaching the truth. And they said, this is the response, verse 33, or verse 34. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? That's, what, that's what's being warned against in Isaiah chapter 65. It, we get this air of holiness and self-righteousness that we lose our teachability. We're not inclined daily to be confronted with the Isaiah 6 experience that God would show me. Because you know what happens if God shows you more of his glory? You will see more of your sin. But you'll also find the beauty of the Savior. It's transformative. And finally, I just want you to see also that we need, I put in, we need to uh, lose our religious naivety. What I actually think I probably should put here is we should lose our religious pretense. And again, let me show you in this text of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 65 a little bit later where the Lord confronts them in verse 11. He says, but you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who set a table of fortune and fix cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you for the sword. Man, what a heavy word. They have entered into idolatry, yet they still think they're the people of God. And he said, I will destine you to the sword and all of you will bow down to the slaughter because when I called you, you did not answer. When I spoke, you did not listen, but you did what was evil in my eyes and chose, that I, chose what I did not delight in. And so you have this text of scripture where they have these idols that shape their hearts. And then a little bit later, he's looking for the verse where he says, Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at the Lord. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for my name's sake have said, let the Lord be glorified. That's down in Isaiah 66, verse 5 and 6. Sorry, I jumped out. Verse 5. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at the Lord. Your brothers who hate you and cast you out for your name's sake, they have said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, and it is those who have put to shame. It's an interesting thing. That's what they actually said to that man in, in the Gospel of John. Give glory to God by denying Jesus. And, and what's going on in that passage of Scripture? Well, what's actually happening is that these religious leaders are professing that they're interested in the joy and protection and good of the people, but what, what, what are they actually protecting? The life to which their idolatries to which they become accustomed. And God said, I'm going to deal with your idolatry. So we, when we think about that in terms of hallowed be your name, we've got to make sure that one of the things we're not seeking to do when people come and engage us is that we're trying to protect the life to which we become accustomed. How much of what's going on in America, how much of the, the raging of the church is driven by our idolatries rather than our worship? It's worth thinking about, isn't it? I'm not saying we don't have responsibility as citizens. We do. But we have to be careful. What is it in my heart that is driving me? And we have to check that all the time. It can happen in our homes. 
This often happens sometimes in our homes. Kids will begin to be awakened to the Lord and their parents are just religious. And their kids start to get serious and the parents become protective. Don't get too carried away, right? Don't get too serious about this thing. We don't want to see. And then their kids start to talk about going on the mission field and living for the Lord. And all of a sudden what you realize, the parents' vision of a comfortable American lifestyle is suddenly threatened. And their future and their heritage with their children, their dream is not. And suddenly God comes in and says, this is my child. You are just a steward. And so we've got to come back. We've got to come back to the word of God and ask the question, what does it mean to hallow your name? It means this, you, O oh God, are God and worthy to be heard. And I've got to pray that God would remove all of my religious performance, all of my religious pride, all of my superficial pretension, oh, that I'm interested in, in everybody's good and the glory of God and your joy. Am I really? Isn't that searching? Have you prayed the Lord's Prayer this way before? It's a powerful text, isn't it? So let me just think through that another way. Let's go back to just think about what this means when we pray, Our Father, where is He? Who art in heaven. Go to Isaiah 66, who art in heaven. I'm showing you that in Isaiah, God is called Father, the potter of the clay, the one who forms us. Isaiah, He's in the heavens. So I, I said, first of all, that this is a, you know, a prayer that we do collectively for the church of God. This is also a prayer that we can have confidently. Because when you see the holiness of God, what's your response? Is your response like Isaiah? Oh boy. I hope up till now you felt oh boy. I hope that if you've heard anything of the holiness of God this morning, you've got a little sense, woe is me. Because if you encounter the holiness of God, you don't feel a little bit of woe is me. You have not seen God high and lifted up in the temple. But here's the hope. Here's the great thing. Who does the Lord respond to? Listen to Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, our, you know, our Father, where is he? Who art in heaven. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is the place of my rest? Do you understand what God's saying here? He's going, I don't need your religious activity. This isn't about God being a needy God in the heavens, wanting a bunch of people chanting to him, mindlessly bowing before him. This is the God of heavens who has made us for his glory and who knows what's for our good. And he's not looking for performance. He's looking for broken people who will come to him and be made that we see his glory and we seek his face through Jesus Christ. So notice what is acceptable. This, verse 2, all these things my hand has made and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord, but this is the one to whom I will look. Who? He who is, what? Humble and contrite in spirit and trembles in my word. So it trembles at my word. So let me just say to you, how do I pray? How should we pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is how you pray. Pray this. Humble us, God. We pray humbly. What, what does it mean? It mean I, I put in my notes here, it's not in your notes. We, we need to pray that God would make us perpetually receptive to the work of the Holy Spirit, to the Word of God, wh that we would be perpetually teachable. It doesn't matter who comes along. If they show me the glory of God, that they remind me of something of God, that I would come to God and humble myself. If my people who are called by my name, right, will humble themselves. My dear friends, God is not looking for spiritual perfect people. We're called to be perfect at the end of Matthew chapter 5 as our Heavenly Father is perfect. But the only way to move towards perfection is to invite God by the power of His Spirit to perfect us. I can't do it. So the posture is, hallowed be your name, is say, God, come, holy God, come and show me your holiness and make me holy every day. He invites us into that. That's who the Lord looks to. He's not looking for churchy people. He's looking for humble people. And contrite, 
those who are contrite in spirit. So I put in my notes here, God make me perpetually receptive and make me perpetually repentant or make me perpetually teachable and keep me perpetually turning. That means my whole life is learning and growing and listening and turning and learning and growing. I can only do this because of Jesus. I can only do this because I know that Christ has paid the price for all my sins. He's paid for it all. And so I don't need to be afraid of God exposing. You know, in John chapter 3, they were afraid to come into the light because their evil deeds would be exposed. Come into the light. Let him burn off the chaff. Show me, O God. Change my heart, O God. Search me, O God. And know my heart today. And see if there be any unclean. Do you pray that prayer? That's what it means to be Hallowed be your name. You're holy. I'm not. Help me. Turn me. Help me to be contrite. And it says, who trembles at my word. That's back to Psalm chapter 2, tremble and rejoice. Do you tremble? Have you lost your ability to tremble before God? Again, trembling is not cowering in a sense of waiting for an angry God to slap you. Christ has paid the price for our sins. But trembling at his word is that more than what's going on in my circumstances, I need to hear what God has said in his word. More than I believe the voice of condemnation for my sins, I need to hear the truth of God in the gospel. I need to hear the trembling at the word of God is that the word of God is the final authority in my life. The word of God is the first voice I seek in the morning. The word of God is what I must hear above every other voice. Turn off your TV. Turn off the evening news if you have not bowed before God and listened to his word. Have you stopped trembling? In the good sense, trembling. Have you stopped inviting God to search me, oh God, and know my heart? To bow and say, you are holy, 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 and I need help, help, help. <laughs> That's a great position to be in, because what's our God like? He's a compassionate God who forgives. That's the whole Romans 8. It's finished, friends. It's finished. Your sins are paid for. Let him do the surgery. Right? You will not die, because he has already died. He'll, he'll let you live. It's paid for in full. There's joy and rest in the Savior. Why hold on to the dark places of your heart and fear that he won't accept you? Invite him in. It's paid for. You are clean through the blood of Jesus Christ, righteous in God's sight. Let the surgeon come in. Let the doctor come in. Let him do his work. Let him teach you and cause you to grow. That's what we mean by hallowed be your name. Be holy in my heart. And so that's that's a prayer that we can be confident in. He will help us. He hears the broken. He's, it's not the performers. It's not the perfect. It's not those who compare themselves to everybody else. It's not a competition. It's Christ. It's Christ. Now, I want to say one last thing. This is also a comprehensive prayer. And all I mean by that is that the, when you begin to long in your heart that God would be hallowed, you will long that he would be hallowed not only in your heart, but to the ends of the earth. But I, I want to bring this home for our church family and just say this, that if you want to know how the world is going to come to know God and his glory and to revere God and to hallow God, it is not by our religiosity. It is not by our superiority. It is not by our performance. It is when we humble ourselves before God. And when the world looks at us and our humility and our contriteness, and we are genuinely affected by God no matter what's going on, that we bow the knee to him, then people will look at us and go, man, they believe in their God. And so... Isaiah chapter 64, Isaiah is holding out this promise. And you know what the promise is? That when his people humble themselves, he will send these broken, humble, contrite people out to testify to the world, and God will bring the nations to himself. Listen to Isaiah 64. 
For I know their works and their thoughts, and the time is coming to gather all nations and tongues. And they will come and shall see my glory and shall set a sign among them. And from them I will send survivors to the to Tarshish and Pol and Lud, who draw the bow to Tubal and to Javan, to the coastlands far away that have not seen my glory. Isn't that great? What's he talking about there? He's talking about Equatorial Guyana that we prayed about earlier today. He's talking about their enemies. And they shall declare my glory among the nations, and they shall bring all your brothers from all the nations as an offering to the Lord. What is the testimony? What does it mean to be a missionary? What does it mean to give witness? It's to go out into the world and say, you know what we're struggling with? We're struggling with we have all these other gods, but there's only one God. And these gods cannot save us. They only divide us, devour us, right? America can see it. We are more polarized than we have ever been in our history, it seems. Very few times. The, the, the toxicity of the discussion. And we got, look, when we all have our own gods and we all bow to our own gods, we all bite one another and turn one another. That's what's going on here. But there is one God. And the church of Jesus Christ doesn't need to enter the fray of the idolaters. We need to stand up and say, there is one God and he is worthy of worship. Let every tribe and every tongue bow before him. And people say, how do you know that? Because he's been merciful to me. I'm as toxic as you are. I'm as backbiting as you are. And he came and he showed me that I was my own worst enemy. But if I confess my sins, he was faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And when we go out as those who have been survivors to the nations and talk about the Savior by whom we survived, the nations will turn to God. We're not, the world does not need religion. The world needs God. It needs a Savior. It needs a God who forgives the religious, the self-righteous, the backbiting. Do you believe that? Is that what you long for? You know, the beauty of this is when you go into the Lord's Prayer, it doesn't matter how old you are, it recalibrates you. You can be the youngest person or you can be the oldest person and you begin to pray. It, you know, it's one of the beauties of it. Some, of the pe some people's most fruitful years are yet to come and they think they've done the majority of their lives. I've seen converts at the age of 69, 68 and live another 20, 30 years and seen their children and their extended family come to Christ because not because they were a good dad growing up but because they were a repentant dad at the fading hours of their lives. Isn't that great news? So would you pray this prayer with me? Humble me. Help me be contrite. Help me seek your face, dear God. Turn from my evil ways. God, would you show me that you're holy? That's what it means, hallowed. Be your name. Hallowed. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Jesus be at the center of my life. So maybe someone today, maybe at this moment, you know, You've grown indifferent to God. Can I invite you to turn to God right now? To cry out to God, to confess, to humble yourself, to seek him. He'll receive you. <laughs> Isn't that great? The, the picture in Isaiah is of a God who repeatedly calls, and a God who repeatedly seeks, and a God who receives. Would you return to God today? Or would you for the first time turn to him and be forgiven and be received? It is not your holiness, it's his holiness. It's not your performance, it's Christ's finished work. Jesus did it for you. You can come home, you can enter the family, you can be forgiven today. Let's pray that together. Let's pray together. Father, no matter what's in our background, let us see your holiness in Jesus Christ. And would you help us, O oh God, to seek your face? Help us, O oh God, to turn from our evil ways. Help us, O oh God, to look to you. The, the need of America, the need of the world, dear God, is not political. It's not constitutional. It's not economical. It's spiritual. We need the Lord. Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. Oh, God, would you forgive our sins and heal our land? Would you call us to Jesus 
our wonderful Savior. Help us to look fully in his face and see him at the center of our lives, the center of our hopes, the center of our future. Oh, God, would you come and do that, we pray. Help us, help each of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God. So, friends, you can be weak, and you can be broken, you can struggle with prayer, and you can go to God. You can learn from him and ask him to realign you and listen to him and trust that he'll build you. So let's just pray for that. Let me pray a blessing over you in this as we begin to ask the Lord to align our hearts with his priorities in his kingdom. Father, thank you that we do not have to perform. It is not our performance that brings us into your presence, but it's Christ's perfect performance when he lived and died and rose again on our behalf. And so in the grace and love of Jesus, give your people strength. In the grace and love of Jesus, give your people hope. Give them comfort and call them near and make us, dear God, a people of prayer. Christ bought our access to you that we might be a temple of the living God. So live and reign in us and may the nations be glad, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great Sunday. Happy Mother's Day.